Okay, so good evening everyone. Today we are going to continue with our presentation on the basics of the brain CT scan. This is the third part. Uh, I, I hope that you still remember that last time we were talking about the uh, distribution in the arterial territories uh, that are found in um, uh, ischemic uh, brain uh, uh, cerebral vascular accidents. And we were uh, we talked about the middle cerebral artery, uh, anterior cerebral artery, and posterior cerebral artery territories, and the vertebrobasilar system. Uh, another type of ischemic uh, uh, events that happens in the brain, including what we called small vessel disease or chronic small vessel disease. What happens in the chronic small vessel disease? is that the smaller, the, the, more, the tiny arterioles of the brain get occluded over time and it is part of an aging process. It's a normal aging process that you usually see in older age group patients. We don't see that in younger patients unless there is some sort of pathology or arteriopathy and uh, this will result in loss of the volume of the brain parenchyma of the brain white matter because these are where these uh, tiny arterioles are present. So it's like uh, having many, many tiny strokes resulting in volume loss and decrease in the density of the white matter of the brain, especially in the periventricular distribution. It's more uh, at the periventricular distribution, especially around the anterior and posterior horns of the lateral ventricle. And uh, you can see there is evidence of some sort of diffuse brain atrophy. You can see the cell side are wide and prominent and big. And you can see here the color-coded part is the part that's mainly affected by the chronic small vessel disease. Also, uh, another type is what's called uh, lacunar infarcts. Lacunar infarcts are defined as infarcts less than one centimeter in diameter. So, uh, you don't see new lacunar infarcts, you see just the old ones, because the new ones are isodense to the brain parenchyma, so you can't see it unless you have a diffusion-weighted MRI image. In the CT scan, they are not uh, seen, uh, and when it, they become old, or a chronic uh, form of uh, lacunar infarcts, the, uh, the brain parenchyma here gets resorbed and leaving this rounded or uh, circular or oval shaped uh, holes in the brain parenchyma and they are uh, defined, uh, they are called uh, lacunar infarcts. So it's just a brain uh, CVA or, some, or a sort of stroke that is small and can be symptomatic or asymptomatic according to its location and of course you can see there is uh, a degree of uh, periventricular small vessel disease here and here anterior around the anterior horns of the lateral ventricle indicating that the patient is a relatively old age and you can see in this whole image there is a mild degree of diffuse brain atrophy we said uh, when we see any uh, cerebral vascular accident or any uh, stroke uh, patient, uh, we have to evaluate what we called those, T-H-O-S-E. So regarding the E, which is the evolution over time, uh, we have to follow up the patient uh, after uh, a while to see what's going on with this, uh, anure, with this uh, stroke. So uh, here is an image of a stroke at this part of the brain, the uh, left uh, parietal lobe and this is obviously an MCA distribution so this is uh, an ischemic uh, infarction brain infarction at the left parietal lobe and it is uh, at the left MCA distribution you can see evidence of edema and effacement of the cortical sulci this are uh, the cerebral sulci here are not very well seen like in the frontal lobe here and here and this part of the brain is basically uh, have no blood supply so it will die and it will shrink and it will be resorbed so repeating the CT scan after a while you can see that this part of the brain is almost as if it's missing you can't see it here you see just white matter there is no gray matter this is a gray matter and it adds up to here and the rest is just white matter and it's replaced by fluid density which is the CSF you can see here this density is the same as the CSF in the subarachnoid space here. So this is what's called porencephaly. Porencephalic cavity, porencephalic cyst, porencephalic lesion, whatever you like, is the same. So this indicates 
uh, ischemic infarction old ischemic infarction and you can see it's resolved here and of course uh, there is another small rounded object or lesion here which is an old lacunar infarct and you can see that in the later images there is some sort of uh, possibly evidence of uh, small vessel disease also now we said that the stroke is of two main types either ischemic or hemorrhagic we talked about all kinds of ischemic stroke and now it's time to uh, talk about the hemorrhagic stroke we have to recognize and to diagnose hemorrhagic stroke because otherwise this will mean uh, if we missed it the clinicians will give a thrombolytic to the patient which will increase the bleeding and this will result in massive brain intracranial hemorrhage and basically kills the patient so we have to recognize any hemorrhagic stroke uh, that's present for example you can see here this is a, we said blood the blood clots are denser than the soft tissues but less dense than the bone so you can see here is a whitish lesion whitish uh, density uh, seen at the uh, left uh, basal ganglia distribution and it's surrounded by this hypodense rim which is the edema surrounding the hematoma the intracranial or the intraparenchymal hematoma and this mass is causing compression of the adjacent uh, lateral ventricle the left lateral ventricle with midline shift to the uh, right side and you can see the cerebral salsa here are also effaced and they are not well seen why is this a uh, hemorrhage and not a calcification well basically there is a mass effect calcification does not have this kind of mass effect and the density of the lesion is less than that of the of the bone you can see the bone here is much more denser than here and you can see also uh, the calcified choroid plexus it is des denser than the lesion indicating this is a blood hematoma also another uh, hemorrhagic uh, uh, stroke or intraparenchymal hematoma seen at uh, the right cerebral hemisphere at the posterior aspect of the parietal lobe and uh, this is an intraparenchymal hematoma again another example this is an intraparenchymal hematoma you can see here surrounded by edema uh, causing some mass effect on the adjacent lateral ventricle here you can see it is compressed compared to the uh, left side uh, the most common branch that it causes uh, is associated with hemorrhagic uh, stroke or hematoma or intraparenchymal hemorrhage is the lenticulostriatal artery which is basically the feeder of the basal ganglia that's why you almost you, most of the time you have hemorrhagic strokes at the region of the basal ganglia due to involvement of the lenticulostriate artery which is a branch of the middle cerebral artery so it causes a hematoma uh, and most of the times not always many times uh, it's due to hypertension hypertense uncontrolled hypertension results in rupture or uh, bleeding from this arteriole okay and you can see here this is a patient with uncontrolled hypertension uh, again this is an intraparenchymal hematoma you can see it is at the distribution of the right uh, basal ganglia so indicating most likely it is from the lenticular striatal branch of the uh, right middle cerebral artery and it is surrounded by hematoma causing mass effect on the adjacent ventricle uh, with possible might be allowed a little bit of midline shift and the overlying sulci are effaced compared to the left side here they are obviously effaced due to the mass effect caused by the hematoma and the adjacent uh, or the surrounding edema these are the uh, subsequent uh, axial uh, images you can see it extends over several uh, uh, sections or several cuts of the brain uh, indicating that uh, it is a rather big hematoma these are other types of uh, intraparenchymal hematoma. You can see here, it is not at the region, region of the basal ganglia. Uh, it is uh, maybe at the uh, deeper part of the left uh, parietal lobe. Okay, I don't agree uh, with this what's written here because the thalamus here is intact and the basal ganglia are intact. Uh, also another uh, hematoma, you can see it here in the right parietal lobe. What's different here is that there is a 
hematocrit level fluid blood level so indicating this is a not not a very fresh hematoma it's been a while since this formed causing the rbcs to be sedimented at the base of the uh, lesion causing what we call a hematocrit level you can see there is some edema in the surrounding uh, brain parenchyma again another uh, intracerebral hematoma this is a secondary to arteriovenous malformation so this is not a hypertensive stroke it's uh, due to arteriovenous malformation and uh, you can see the compression of the right lateral ventricle and midline shift to the left side uh, so, as we said, the common sites of central parenchymal hematoma is mainly at the ganglio-capsular region due to rupture of the small arteries, the perforators, particularly the lenticulostriatal artery. You can see it here at the basal ganglia. Uh, different cases, all of them at the basal ganglia distribution, and these are mostly due to hypertensive stroke. Uh, we need to calculate the amount of the blood in any parenchymal hematoma and why is that because we uh, as we follow the patient over time we can uh, if we calculate the amount of hematoma amount of blood within the lesion uh, this uh, might help us to determine whether the lesion is increasing in size there is more bleeding or it's the same size stable or it's decreasing in size so uh, how can we calculate the amount of the blood in a hematoma just like we calculate the volume of any part of the uh, of the body just like you calculate the volume of the prostate on, on, on an ultrasound exam you multiply the length by the width by the height by 0.5 or 0.52 and this the result will be the volume of the blood in this hematoma so if we consider this is an intraparenchymal hematoma you take the, the widest part the width and the length and the height which is the number of slides or of sections that the hematoma is uh, seen on uh, for example here you can see it's one two three four five so these are five slides each about one centimeter thickness you know you should know the slice thickness that you are dealing with so uh, it's the length by the width by five which is five centimeter the height by 0.5 and this will be the result of the volume of the hematoma of course if you have a reconstruction like like sagittal or coronal reconstruction you can just measure the height from the coronal or the sagittal images and you don't need to count the number of the slides uh, bleeding can be uh, either intraparenchymal or subarachnoid hemorrhage and this is a diagram shows the difference between the intracerebral or intraparenchymal and the subarachnoid part the intraparenchymal part is surrounded by uh, brain parenchyma by cerebral parenchyma okay while the subarachnoid part you can see it in the subarachnoid space, spaces like over the cerebral sulci at the midline over the fox cerebri and at the quadrigeminal play, uh, cistern and other cisterns at the base of the brain for example here you can see at the prepontine uh, cistern you can see a density that indicates a subarachnoid hemorrhage while here you can see the intraparenchymal hematoma however this hematoma is extending into the adjacent lateral ventricle you can see the ventricle also uh, contains blood so this indicates intraparenchymal hematoma with intraventricular extension this is a diagram that shows the hematoma within the left parietal lobe and surrounded by edema okay and you can see within the hematoma there is a small hematocrit level indicating it's not a very fresh one uh, it has been some time since this hematoma developed you can see some surrounding edema and you can see multiple particular hemorrhages at the adjacent brain parenchyma however the subarachnoid spaces are intact they are they doesn't they don't contain any signs of blood so there is unlikely to be any subarachnoid hemorrhage in this case here we can see that there is an intraparenchymal hematoma that extends into the surface of the right cerebral hemisphere it's causing mass effect compression of the right lateral ventricle and you can see that it extends into the cerebral sulci here so indicating that this uh, has a subarachnoid uh, 
hemorrhage or extending into the subarachnoid space. There is subarachnoid bleeding in this case. However, when we have a bone window of this part and we magnify it, we can see that there is a fracture here and this fracture most likely injured uh, an artery over the surface of the brain and adjacent to brain parenchyma. So there is subarachnoid bleeding in addition to the intraparenchymal hematoma. So, let's see some examples of intracerebral hematoma without ventricular extension and with ventricular extension. Without ventricular extension, you can see in these images, you can see that this is the hematoma and it's completely surrounded by brain parenchyma. It does not reach the brain surface and you can see that the overlying uh, subarachnoid space is normal, although the images are not very well, uh, very good quality, but uh, we can do something with it. So you can see that the ventricles have no blood in them, so indicating there is no intraventricular extension and the cerebral sulci uh, does not have increased density indicating no subarachnoid hemorrhage. Now what about if it has a ventricular extension? You can see here this is a hematoma that is extending into the lateral ventricle. You can see here the lateral ventricle contains a hematocrit level, both right and left uh, occipital horns of the lateral horn. Both of them contains a hematocrit level, indicating there is a ventricular extension because the blood reached the ventricle somehow. And if you look carefully, you can see there is a blood uh, in the prepontine cistern uh, here and at the uh, suprasillar cistern and also along the middle cerebral artery bilaterally. These are subarachnoid spaces. You can see it in the cerebral sulci here and here. And you can see that it is also in the, in the third ventricle at the midline. And you can see there is this uh, clot possibly in the uh, lateral ventricle indicating that this uh, is an intraparenchymal hematoma with extension to the uh, ventricle and, po uh, and possibly sub with an associated subarachnoid hemorrhage. And how does the blood go from the brain parenchyma to the ventricle? It goes by jet flow. The uh, arterial bleeding results in jet flow into the ventricle. Another example here, you can see the blood in the occipital horns of the lateral ventricle with hematocrit level due to the sedimentation of the red blood cells. Also, you can see it at the uh, third ventricle and you can see it at the subarachnoid spaces of, of the overlying uh, on the epsilateral part of the uh, left cerebral hemisphere. And you can see that the, uh, this is the intraparenchymal component with surrounding edema. Again, this is another example of uh, a ventricular uh, hemorrhage. You can see that uh, lateral ventricle is almost almost completely filled with dense material, which is the blood in the ventricular extension. You can see also here and here, and you can see in the uh, third ventricle, uh, in the third at the midline, uh, and you can see that there is a evidence of also subarachnoid hemorrhage here and here. Okay, and if you look carefully, the major part of the bleeding is somewhere here at the midline anteriorly, indicating, so you can see here also, this is the same finding, indicating that most likely this is a due to a ruptured anterior communicating artery aneurysm. Again, another example, this is the aneurysm of the anterior communicating artery, we call the ACOM aneurysm. Okay, at the midline, with you can see a thrombus at the center and surrounding uh, blood, and you can see the extension into the subarachnoid space, and you can see along the cerebral, along the middle cerebral arteries and the prepontine cistern, and also in the fourth ventricle, indicating there is a ventricular extension. You can see also at the uh, interpeduncular uh, cistern here and at the uh, uh, ambient cistern on the right and left side of the brain also in the sylvian fissure, so there are multiple areas of subarachnoid hemorrhage. Another example of uh, uh, in, 
hematomas with ventricular extension. You can see this is a bleeding within the right cerebellar hemisphere extending into the fourth ventricle resulting in dilatation of the temporal horn of the uh, lateral ventricle indicating uh, obstruction due to hydrocephalus and also you can see the blood in the third ventricle. Also, you can see there is blood in the fissures here and here, okay, along the prepontine cistern and along the uh, ambient cistern, uh, the ambient cisterns also in the fourth ventricle in this uh, image without color coding. Here we can uh, see the presence of What's that? This is an acute infarction. How we know that this is acute infarction, not chronic and not anything else? You can see that this is edema, decreased density of the brain parenchyma due to the presence of fluid causing edema. And you can see that the overlying sulci are effaced. They are not seen, not very obvious like you see here. For example, compared to the other side, these sulci are very prominent and they look nice and uh, normal in appearance while here they are effaced they are not present due to the edema okay and this is an acute infarction at the distribution of what artery exactly this is the distribution of the middle the right middle cerebral artery good good job here we can see a few findings. First of all, you can see that the cerebral sulci are prominent bilaterally. They are big, indicating the presence of some degree of diffuse brain atrophy. Okay, so this is most likely an uh, elderly patient or old uh, age. And you can see the presence of this irregular hypodense uh, part of the white matter in the periventricular distribution around the anterior horns of the lateral ventricle indicating a diffuse brain atrophy this is a uh, sorry a periventricular small vessel disease this is a very uh, periventricular small vessel disease and if you look carefully you can see this fluid level here this is a hematocrit level indicating the presence of intraventricular blood intraventricular hemorrhage with sedimentation of the red blood cells uh, in the uh, basal part or most posterior part of the ventricle uh, due to the presence of intraventricular hemorrhage okay now let's see here what's what do we have we have this is a normal sulcus okay it's the same the density of uh, csf fluid okay and you can see here at the color coded part there is an increased density of the sulcus it is not within the brain it is at the space between the adjacent gyri this is a gyrus and this is another gyrus and the space between them the sulcus is dense indicating the presence of a subarachnoid hemorrhage at this part it can be massive as uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage like we saw before or it can be just a small amount and keep in mind that always the subarachnoid hemorrhage always the patient comes complaining of the worst headache of his life he says i have a very severe headache some people call it thunder clapping it's just like thunder very severe headache so in every patient not with headache with severe headache the worst headache in his life you should suspect the presence of subarachnoid hemorrhage and you need to look for it okay now let's see here there is this density here that is an intraparenchymal or intracerebral hematoma and uh, you can see the presence of surrounding edema okay causing expansion of this part of the brain resulting in some maybe mild mass effect and you can see that it is extending into the medial aspect of the uh, right of, of the left cerebral hemisphere with this uh, increased density between the sulci you see this sulci sulcus and compare it with the other one 
and you can see this is an increased density and of course you can see some increased density here at this part of the brain compared with this also here this is an increased density indicating that this is an intraparenchymal hematoma extending into the subarachnoid space causing subarachnoid hemorrhage also so there is subarachnoid bleeding and uh, extending along the flux cerebrum on the left side and into the overlying cerebral sulci. Now, let's see this case. I know the images are not very uh, sharp, not a very high quality, but we can uh, work with it. Uh, first, you can see there is a blood in the fourth ventricle here. So there is ventricular hemorrhage. And from the fourth ventricle, it's extending into the third ventricle. This is the midline, and the thalami are on both sides. And you can see the third ventricle is dense. And also, you can see blood in the occipital horns of the lateral ventricle, bilaterally. So, all the ventricles contains blood. This is the first thing. Second thing, if we look carefully, we can see that there is a big hematoma here and this is where the ganglio-capsular uh, region in which uh, the lenticulostriate artery is present and obviously it is ruptured resulting in hematoma okay and also if you look you can see the temporal horns of the lateral ventricle are prominent bilaterally okay prominent bilaterally indicating early onset hydrocephalus due to the presence of blood in the ventricles preventing the CSF flow of course this uh, presence of a thrombus here can suggest the presence of a, a ruptured aneurysm somewhere in this part of the uh, skull base of the brain so the possibility of ruptured aneurysm should be considered uh, and a conventional uh, angiography or even MRI can be recommended to detect the presence of a thrombus or not now Let's talk a little bit about the subarachnoid hemorrhage due to the ruptured aneurysm. When there is an aneurysm, aneurysm, it is a dilatation of the artery. It is the artery, the normal artery, gets dilated focally at a specific part of it, becomes uh, like a sac-like lesion, okay? And this part that is dilated, it's structurally weak. So it is liable to rupture because it is weak, okay? So any increased blood pressure for any sort or sometimes even spontaneously it ruptures, okay, resulting in subarachnoid hemorrhage. Most of the times it causes subarachnoid hemorrhage. So if we look here, you can see there is a big subarachnoid hemorrhage filling all the cisterns, maybe in the ambient cisterns bilaterally. You can see in the quadrigeminal cistern also and the uh, prepontine system, the supracellular system, everywhere there is bleeding and you can see it in the cerebral, uh, in the sylvian fissures bilaterally and you can see this clot here or this density within the uh, the right uh, part of the frontal uh, lobe of the right cerebral hemisphere and this indicates the focal uh, clot indicates the most likely this is the site of the aneurysm that has ruptured okay so when we are doing an MRI or a catheter angiography we need to look here for the exact site of aneurysm and of course if you have an interventional neuroradiology unit we can do coiling of this aneurysm we just put a coil a small wire within the aneurysm it will cause it to clot and when it clots, uh, it will stop bleeding most of the times, or we can uh, go to surgery for clipping of this ruptured aneurysm. And again, you can see the dilated temporal horns of the lateral ventricle. We don't see that uh, normally. And these dilated temporal horns indicating early onset hydrocephalus. Now, subdural hematoma and extradural hematoma is a very uh, popular topic let's say uh, it, uh, we we see them in a lot of uh, textbooks and a lot of uh, lectures and uh, we reviewed them a lot so I will talk about the differences between the subdural and extradural hematoma briefly uh, so that we can know the difference between them first of all the epidural hematoma is located between the bone, the inner table of the bone, and 
the uh, dura mater. That's why it is epidural. It is outside the dura, between the dura and the bone. Okay. Usually, it is due to arterial arterial bleeding. It is due to laceration of an artery. Okay. So, because the artery passes between the inner table of the bone of the skull vault and the dura. Here is the artery. Which artery? Most of the times, the vast majority of the times, it is the middle meningeal artery. And the middle meningeal artery is a branch of the maxillary artery, which is a branch of the external carotid artery. So the external carotid artery gives the maxillary artery, which gives the middle meningeal artery, which supplies the most of the dura. And this artery is the, the major cause of epidural hematoma so it is an arterial bleeding and keep in mind that the artery has a muscular wall the wall of the artery is muscle soft tissue uh, smooth muscles i'm sorry uh, soft uh, smooth muscles is the uh, wall the majority of the wall of the artery and the smooth muscles this muscular wall means the artery is relatively strong it is a uh, strong structure so it is it does not uh, lacerate easily you cannot lacerate an artery very easily you need a significant force to cut or rupture an artery so this means that if you have an epidural hematoma epidural you need to look carefully for the presence of a fracture most of the times there is a skull vault fracture that causes the artery to lacerate and bleed and causes epidural hematoma okay and you when you have a fracture when the patient have a fracture uh, you should look for other fractures you don't stop at just one fracture usually there are multiple most of the time there are multiple fractures okay the epidural hematomas have lens shape they have because the dura here is strong and the bone is strong so it will separate the dura from the bone resulting in this lens shaped appearance you can see here this is a lens shaped appearance of the epidural hematoma also <coughs> since the dura is fairly attached at the area of the sutures of the brain it does not the epidural hematoma respects the sutures it, they, uh, the epidural hematoma does not cross the suture line. You have here the coronal suture, which links the frontal bone with the parietal bone. The epidural hematoma stops there, does not cross the suture line, or does not, uh, or it does not uh, cross the uh, sagittal or uh, the lambdoid suture it stops at the suture line okay the uh, epidural hematoma now let's yeah the uh, let's talk about the subdural hematoma the subdural hematoma it is venous in nature subdural hematoma is venous in nature The subdural hematoma is venous in nature. So this means that the subdural hematoma it is low pressure bleeding. Low pressure bleeding. Okay. The subdural hematoma is venous and it is a low pressure because it is a vein. The vein has a wall that has very thin muscle muscular tissue. So the vein is easily ruptured. The vein is easily ruptured okay so you have subdural hematoma with relatively mild uh, force mild trauma okay and this will result uh, the, the relatively mild trauma will in, usually don't have an associated fracture you just have the patient have just have a subdural hematoma without an associated fracture okay so this indicates the the veins are located in the in the uh, skull vault. The brains, are, the veins are located in the subarachnoid space. The veins call they called bridging veins, bridging veins, located in the subarachnoid space. 
So this indicates that the subdural hematoma is, uh, uh, sorry, the veins are located deep to the dura mater. I'm so sorry. I just uh, did a little mistake here. The veins are located deep to the dura. So the dura mater is here, okay? And the bone, the uh, inner table of the skull bone is here. And the veins are located just deep to the dura. This is called uh, these called bridging veins. So with mild trauma, these veins might rupture, resulting in subdural hematoma. And since the subdural hematoma is deep to the dura, it does not respect the suture lines. It extends over sutures. For example, you can see here this is the coronal suture the coronal suture and the hematoma is crossing over to over the suture so this is a big difference between subdural and epidural hematomas the subdural does not cross uh, so, uh, the subdural crosses the suture line while the epidural does not cross the suture line respects the suture line and usually usually not always subdural hematoma uh, occurs seen more commonly in older age group with a brain atrophy because when the uh, human being has a brain atrophy then these bridging veins will be uh, long and uh, the subarachnoid space will be big because the, there is brain atrophy so the subarachnoid space will be more prominent and these veins will bridging veins will be long so the brain movement will be more resulting in easily la uh, lacerated uh, bridging veins okay easily lacerated veins so the subdural hematoma usually older age group crosses the fissure and uh, it is uh, look wavy against the brain surface it's just printing on the brain surface and it is not lens shaped unless in special uh, conditions but in general it is uh, take the shape of the underlying brain parenchyma okay now we said that hemorrhage outside the brain substance not intraparenchymal it's either extradural or subdural and we talked about the differences the epidural is lens shaped while the subdural uh, respects the uh, sorry uh, yani takes the shape of the brain uh, surface uh, in epidural it is confined it is well defined because it is between the bone and the dura both of them are strong uh, anatomical structures so it will be biconvex lens shape it is arterial okay so from where arterial from the injury to the middle meningeal artery and they arise between the inner table of the skull and the dura as we said while the subdural hematoma is uh, between the dura and the arachnoid matter and they arise from the ruptured veins so it's a venous blood it is low pressure bleeding it appears as crescentic shape according to the underlying brain uh, hemispheres and the hematoma is more widely spread and irregular in our margin because there is a brain here okay usually this is usually post-traumatic you can see a fracture associated fracture and uh, while the subdural can be after mild trauma and usually there is no associated fracture sometimes cases of child abuse can develop epidural hematomas and uh, it is arterial bleeding so it might enlarge in size over time let's see here we can see this is the brain surface and the extradural hematoma does not cross the suture line the extradural hematoma does not cross the suture line it stops here and it stops here at the side of the suture also stopping here so wherever there is suture usually it stops at the suture line it is in younger patients usually post-traumatic uh, while the uh, epidural the subdural hematoma it's crescentic in shape it crosses the suture line usually in older age group you can see some brain atrophy here uh, 
and uh, it is uh, venous blood, not arterial. So it's unlikely that it uh, increases in size because venous blood pressure is very low. Okay. The clue to the diagnosis is that if you do not find the ventricle or you find ventricular effacement on one side, if you see this ventricle is abnormal, okay, then you look uh, for the intracranial space occupying lesion, intracerebral hematoma, or massive infarction. If you don't have, the patient doesn't have any space occupying lesion or hematoma or infarction, then you look at the periphery for subdural or extradural hematoma, and of course the history will be of very good help here. For example, you can see this is a biconvex shaped uh, hematoma. It is outside the brain causing some mass effect. You can see the lateral ventricle here is compressed a little bit and this indicates most likely it's, it does not cross to the anterior part due to the presence of a fissure. So this indicates epidural hematoma or extradural hematoma. It's the same thing, epidural or extradural. What do we need here? When you, whenever you see such a case, you always do a bone window. You have to make a bone window in order to confirm the presence of a fracture or not. And you look for, if you see a fracture, you look for other fractures. While here, obviously, this is an older age group patient. You can see the diffuse brain atrophy and the periventricular small vessel disease. These ventricles are dilated due to the atrophy of the brain. And you can see this crescentic density at the left uh, side, left uh, uh, side of the cranial vault. That is the subdural hematoma. It crosses several fissures. Again here. Which kind of hematoma is that? Is it epidural or subdural according to what we said? This is a subdural hematoma, exactly. This is a subdural hematoma. And of course, also you can see that the cerebral sulci are prominent, the brain is a little bit atrophied, indicating that this is an older age group patient. So the subdural hematoma is more likely here than epidural hematoma. The density of the hematoma, the color, the shade of the hematoma will change over time. And this is very important to recognize the presence of the hematoma. When it is in the acute stage, when it is recent, the blood clot is dense. So it will appear as white, acute or hyperdense hematoma, whether it, uh, it is subdural or epidural, it's the same changes. Uh, to be uh, in fact after a while okay when it is in the subacute stage the blood density will start to be less will start to decrease until it reaches the this almost the same density of the adjacent part of the brain so if you look carefully you cannot see any specific mass you cannot see any uh, hematoma like you see here but what do you see? You see the ventricle is compressed, the midline is displaced, okay, and there is a very thick gray matter here compared to here. Compare this gray matter to this gray matter. This gray matter is very thick, and this indicates what? That there is a hematoma in the subacute stage becoming isodense to the gray matter. If you are in doubt, or you have a suspicion, you can do an MRI and the hematoma will be very obvious on almost all sequences. Okay, any sequence of the brain will show a big subdural hematoma here. Okay, so when you see this thick cortical uh, gray matter, highly suspicious in uh, for a hematoma, for subdural hematoma. Sometimes it's not that thick. The problem is sometimes in some patients it might be bilateral subdural hematomas both of them isodense so even if you compare it to the other side you will see that the gray matter is of the same thickness bilaterally this is a problem you here you need to be careful and to have a high suspicion index 
to confirm the presence of bilaterally isodense subdural hematomas and you look, need to look for the uh, ventricles they are compressed or effaced or displaced okay at the later stage when it's in a chronic stage the hematoma will liquefy with will the uh, the blood in it will be resorbed and we, we will end up with just uh, plasma with just a fluid so it will become hypodense okay and the density will gradually disappear okay becomes black so if you see this black thing it indicates the presence of a chronic subdural hematoma it is long-standing subdural hematoma not a recent one and if you have this density the fluid density with a dense uh, part here like with this density in the basal part here or elsewhere in the in the, this is hypodense with hyperdense this can indicate an acute on a chronic hematoma it means you have a the patient have a chronic hematoma okay and for some reason it is re-bleeding it's bleeding again so there is a chronic hematoma and another bleeding recent so it's acute on a chronic hematoma if you see dense blood within the fluid density hematoma okay now this is a very poor quality image but however you can see the uh, lateral uh, ventricle on the right side is a little bit compressed and displaced and you can see there is a fluid density here indicating the presence of chronic subdural hematoma again here this is what we talked about this density is a fluid it's causing mass effect on the adjacent frontal lobe of the right cerebral hemisphere okay it's compressing the cerebral hemisphere you can see the ventricle is compressed and the midline is shifted and you can see that the normal side the right side is uh, dilated okay indicating the presence or the uh, onset of early stage hydrocephalus due to the midline shift and compression but from the right side now if you look here this is a fluid density lesion this is a fluid density but at the basal part of it there is a increased density there is a blood density so what that means is that this is a chronic hematoma this is a chronic hematoma with, with re-bleeding it has bled again and the fresh blood is sedimented uh, at the base of the hematoma so there is, this is an acute on a chronic hematoma you can see here this is an epidural hematoma it is biconvex it is dense indicating blood okay here you must do a bone window to detect the presence of any fracture okay and if you look carefully this is the brain has no signs of uh, uh, atrophy there is no periventricular disease no lacunar infarcts so this is a young patient and i'm sure if we have a history there is some sort of a trauma okay this is the site of the coronal suture and this is the site of the lambdoid suture it is located between the two sutures it did not cross the suture again here you have this density that is crescentic in shape crossing all the sutures on the way it's extending along the brain surface okay and you can see the underlying sulci are effaced compared to this side compare this sulci with these these are effaced indicating this is a subdural hematoma which is arterial or venous bleeding the subdural hematoma is it arterial or venous it's a venous bleeding exactly it's a venous blood okay so it is a low pressure it's unlikely to expand as as opposed to uh, epidural hematoma thank you very much and i hope you got benefit from this presentation see you inshallah later in another uh, presentation